Hey folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to another video where we look at existing tile map games and talk about how their mapping works so that we can steal all the good ideas for ourselves. This is actually my second take on this dungeon crawl video because I forgot that um, normally when you're recording a game, you use something, a mode called game capture uh, to record the screen of the game. And I forgot that with Dungeon Crawl, it doesn't refresh in quite the correct way to get that information. Uh, so there we go. So the, the video didn't move at all, even though the game was definitely on pause. So I'm just clearing up a little bit of space over here so that we can talk about a wee bit of the map. So you can see here, Dungeon Crawl. So Dungeon Crawl is a standard roguelike game, like a true and proper roguelike game, which means it is very much in a very real way a descendant of Rogue. It is a turn-based, tile-based role-playing game with procedurally generated dungeons, permadeath, um, and... Uh, Food tends to be a big important mechanic in roguelikes, as well as items that you discover that are unidentified. So, uh, in this game, a blue potion might be a healing potion, but the next time it might turn out to be poison. So, identifying potions is a very important thing, as well as scrolls and wands and that sort of thing. As well as uh, armor and equipment. You don't know if you've picked up a cursed item or not. Anyway, so it's a great game. You should definitely play it. But what we're going to talk about here is the way the map works. So, in the last video, we looked at RimWorld, and RimWorld was a... Um, was a base building game, which meant a large part of the game involved tiles changing what's on them, or rather objects changing what's on top of the tiles, that sort of thing. Um, the map was sort of a lot more mutable and dynamic. Whereas in this game, this is a roguelike dungeon crawler, the map is not going to change as frequently. And as a result, you can see that there are slightly different design decisions. Now, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup is an open source game. You can actually go and look at the code and see exactly how it's implemented. I have not done that. So this is going to be sort of assumptions and things like this, or certainly in ways that, like, from the user point of view, how does the system feel and appear to work, which is actually a big part of the question. The internal implementation is not always the key thing as much as how does the user interact with things. Okay. So, here are, is the tile system, and we can see each individual tile very clearly on here. And what's important is, as opposed to RimWorld, which sort of had a base tile type, and then we put stuff on top of it, here, the tile type really is the thing. This, this metal wall, for example, does not sit on top of dungeon floor. It, this is just what the tile is. So here you would have, basically, in your array of tiles, you would have an enum or an integer or something like that, you know, an, a, an integer where zero represents floor, one represents rock wall, two represents metal wall, three represents closed door. And literally, when I open this door, I suspect it literally changes the tile type from closed door to open door as a completely separate tile that is sort of kind of unrelated one to the other, is how I suspect it was implemented. We've got some double doors here. We've got some literally some lava. That's literally what it's called, some lava. That's interesting. Um, and then here we have a staircase that leads out of the dungeon. It's worth noting, the staircase, again, most likely is not implemented as a staircase on top of a dungeon floor. It's just the tile type here is tile type 18, or whatever the internal number is, uh, which represents a staircase, which has certain logic and planning like that. Um, again, that's a simple way of implementing it. There are a few other ways of doing it where you're not using sort of internal ID numbers, but it's a very common thing to do in uh, these types of games because having a single integer or even a byte, right? A byte can go from 0 to 255. Well, that's more than enough tile types. That means you only need a single byte for every single tile in your dungeon, which means that saving your file or even how much space it takes in RAM is very, 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 very minimal, which is nice. Now, RAM is pretty cheap these days, so it's a little bit less of a problem than it used to be, but um, copying data structures and loading and unloading things, in particular in games like this where you can go up and down floors, um, it does matter because you want, you know, being able to go up and down floors to happen as quickly as possible. And so if you have sort of like a minimal, very tight uh, memory structure, that makes it a lot easier to handle. You can change the map tiles from time to time. Again, opening and closing doors, I, I'm pretty confident is a way to do that. You can also get something called like a wand of digging that will dig a wall. But again, at that point, all it does is it kind of converts the wall from a wall to a generic floor tile is the way these wand diggings work, for example. So it's a much simpler, um, much simpler map organization. Now, there are, uh, we should talk about how items work in here. Since, unlike in our base building game, I can use auto explore. Oh, although that picked up some gold for me. Unlike in our base building game where the walls and doors are objects, and here really objects only do one thing. They're things like inventory items. So here I killed a goblin and he dropped a club. Now in this game, you can have, um, how do I drop again? Shift click. 
So here, I've dropped more items. So this one tile right over here has multiple items. Uh, the game in the map mode will always tell me what the top item is, but will also let me know that there's more stuff in this tile. So I know it's at least a potion of might. And then when I go on it, in my inventory view down here, I can see that, okay, there's a potion of might, a bread ration, and a club. You can stack as many objects in a single tile as you want in this game. And something, well, nothing in this game, that's not true. I was gonna say nothing in this game really has an inventory uh, count, but that's not actually accurate. If I get multiple items of the same type, so that's a downward stair, uh, which might happen here. So I have left a goblin corpse behind. I'm going to chop it up, which is a common way to get food. Okay, I only got one chunk of flesh. Let's see if we can find multiple copies of something. No, the rats didn't leave corpses. Goblin didn't leave a corpse. It doesn't always. It's a game balance thing. You left a corpse. Okay, so now I have two chunks of flesh, one of which is from a goblin, one of which is from a bat, and they both have slightly different timers. If we sit here and wait long enough, um, I don't know how to like force it. Let me go on auto explore and we'll see what happens. One of these chunks will rot before the other and will actually show up in my inventory as rotten corpse. So it's kind of interesting here in that it's not actually grouping together these as two copies of chunks of flesh. Internally, in the me game's memory, there are still two absolutely individual chunks of flesh, um, each with its own decay timer. It's just in our inventory view, it's very convenient in that it clumps it together because right now they're effectively the same. And if I were to eat one, ooh, we have magic gloves already? They're probably cursed on level one. They're cursed, but they're... Plus zero, so they don't actually give me a penalty. I can't take them off, but that's all right. We can enchant them later on, and they'll get better. Um, hey, level two, yay. Did the chunks go yet? Nope, not yet. Explore a little bit more. Oh, let's kill some stuff. I mean, I can just sit in, in place. Oh, so one of them just rotted away. We saw, see, some of the chunks of flesh in your inventory have rotted away. You can see I only have one. So they're separate timers, and that includes if you drop them on the ground. They, they won't stack them up, or they, they will stack them up into similar numbers. Um, let's kill this bat, and then go back and butcher that. Oh, there's nothing more to butcher. Did I pick it all up? Die! Die! Oh my god, there's like no shortage of critters over here. Cut you up. Actually, it's quite interesting. Cobalts are toxic, so if I cut you up, I can get chunks of meat, but they will show up differently because of that. And again, so I've got seven chunks of meat here, all from different creatures, all with different timers. If I drop them, they're stacked together, but the game internally keeps them as separate items, which is different from the stacking in something like RimWorld, because in RimWorld, um, well, actually, I'm not sure about that. How would the potatoes work if you had one stack of potatoes, but they might have different rot timers? I'm actually not sure you can stack things with different rotting timers. I'm not positive about that in RimWorld, but those, those are things we're going to have to consider in our own design. Anyway, so that pretty much wraps it up. There's not a whole lot to talk about here, um, as far as I know, with the map design. It is worth noting, uh, you can go downstairs here and go to another level, so it will load a whole other level. Meanwhile, the other level is sort of just offloaded and saved to disk or whatever, and is not active. However, it keeps track of the turn that I left that level on, and then when I go back to it, it knows how many turns have gone by and will allow creatures and things on this level to move forward a little bit. They're not, they're not static in time. So that meat that I left behind, for example, if I leave this level long enough and then come back, will have rotted away, for example. Any monster that happened to be here, if I leave and come back, it might not be here anymore. If I've only left very briefly, it might have moved closer to the stairs to be ready to ambush me. If I've left for a long time, it may have wandered off to somewhere completely different in this floor, for example. So um, that I don't think will be an issue with our game because, first of all, we are talking about playing Playing, um, to just having a single a single level, um, at least to start off with. And when we do have multiple levels, well, we're never going to want to freeze anything on the second floor. We're going to want the other floors to you know have the machinery still going, just like more Dwarf Fortressy, uh, which we're going to talk about next. Um, and in Dwarf Fortress, um, every level of the game is constantly going, but only the one you're looking at is currently being rendered, which means you use up a lot less sort of CPU and GPU kind of stuff, uh, whereas things are being processed in the background in a way that is a lot less demanding on the system. So we're going to take a look at Dwarf Fortress next. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, sorry I had to make, redo this video, guys. Um, but this one here, hey, at least the screen is moving. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for watching, and thank you everyone who supports this channel via Patreon funding. You make it so that I'm able to dedicate more time towards creating more content for this channel and to continue our game programming tutorials. If you want to help support the channel, please go over to patreon.com slash quill18creates and support us today. Thank you very much.